Hi, this is Lindsay Oden, Special Research Assistant at the Washington State Attorney General's Office, and this is your AGO Moment in History. In this series, our office will be releasing clips from our oral history project, an ongoing effort to collect and preserve the history of the Attorney General's Office as told by the people who have worked here over the years. In this episode, former Deputy AGs Jeff Goltz and Shirley Batten interview former Attorney General and Governor Chris Gregoire. Gregoire served three terms as Washington State's Attorney General from 1993 to 2005. In this clip, Governor Gregoire describes her decision to file a suit against the tobacco industry to stop the industry's deceptive advertising practices and the way the industry marketed its products to children. The tobacco settlement was the largest in American history. The eventual settlement was for $206 billion to be paid out over 25 years. The settlement also required tobacco companies to display health warnings on their products, stop marketing to youth, and start programs to curb youth smoking. Governor Gregoire says the settlement was one of her proudest accomplishments as Attorney General. Let's take a listen. Uh, so let's turn to some of the policy initiatives that you undertook as Attorney General, and, and we're going to talk about tobacco, but before we get to that, can you talk a little bit about ADR, maybe children's issues, maybe some consumer protection issues? Um, anything that comes to mind in terms of sort of policy initiatives that you took on? So we, um, vulnerables, uh, we were really yes. um, active in the legislature on policy setting with regards to vulnerables, uh, vulnerable adults as well as children. children. Yeah. Um, we were a big advocate for alternative dispute resolution, and that came out of our torts division, frankly. Um, I mean, I remember this story uh, that stuck with me, by the way, when I became governor and where I led the negotiations for tort reform in, out of the governor's office. I remember this woman coming in, and um, she's obviously the plaintiff, and our lawyer uh, had asked somehow uh, of the uh, uh, plaintiff's lawyer, what is it your, your client really wants? And the client interrupting her lawyer and saying, I want an apology. And our lawyer saying, well, how much is that? And her answer was, I don't care about the money. I just want an apology. And to me, that was a very, and I can't remember the case specifically, but it was very telling that we need to look as a state at alternative ways than, than always going to litigation. And sometimes it doesn't work, and it shouldn't work, okay? Well, we ought to take a look at it, and so that's why we were so rigorous about getting our client agencies to understand that and us putting in that as part of the culture in our office. But it takes a level of sophistication. You need to know when to settle and when not and how to and so on. And Torts obviously had the most experience. But we needed to look at, at every case through that lens and ask if it was appropriate. Are we really using our money wisely by taking a case on and on and on? Or do we get out of it? Now, the downside of that is Sometimes it's not worth it taking it on financially, but it's worth it for other reasons. Again, that's training of our people to understand that. And you can't ever get the plaintiff's bar to understand that anything under X, the AG's office will settle. So, I mean, it, was, it wasn't exactly an easy policy that we put in place. But because of someone I just saw out here in the hallway, I gather it's still alive and well and yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> functioning. And certainly in torts it is. Yeah, yeah, that's great, as it should be. Yeah. And, should and we be. did develop a... a ADR policy, and you actually had someone in the role of the ADR coordinator, I think the only attorney general to do that. Right. But that was, it was new, and we were trying to really get our folks to understand that. Right, right. So let's talk about tobacco. <laughs> so uh, can you talk about what the tobacco issue looked like as it first arose and how you got involved? <clears throat> well, um, Mike Moore had filed his case. Attorney General out of Mississippi right. filed his case. Um, and there was talk of others filing. And I had been to D.C. and taken a, a look at it, had good conversations with, with Mike and some others. Um, and then the industry uh, lawyers got all upset and decided that they would frequent offices around the country uh, to try and dissuade the respective attorneys general from filing. 
And I remember that day, I had flown home the day before, and I had picked up a magazine, and uh, there were all these trinkets, trinkets and trash for Joe Camel and the Marlboro Man and so on and so forth. And that was my motivation. Uh -huh. That was my motivation. The unfair, deceptive advertising practices, in my opinion, of the industry with respect to those who were illegal to sell the product to or use the product, right? Um, little did I appreciate that the motivation of the industry was not that, but fear of a Medicaid reimbursement claim from the respective states. And here they had taken everybody, every litigant across the country to their knees, uh, overwhelming them with the legal uh, defense, uh, and burying them, uh, literally. But never did they understand that attorneys general had different causes of action and different motivations, frankly. They came to visit us. Uh, I remember that like it happened yesterday. And I remember in response to the ads, I put out the magazine and I said, I can't tell you how offended I am. I, I consider this unfair and deceptive advertising under my Consumer Protection Act. The answer was, uh, look, we didn't start advertising to youth, but we can't just sit here while our, our, uh, our uh, not opponents, but competitors. our competitors are doing so. So we have a right to advertise. And I said, what? You, I mean, seriously, that's your explanation to me? That if the other guy's doing it, you have a right to do it, despite the fact that Joe Camel is this fictional character and so in the trinkets and trash that all these kids are wearing. And so, yes. But the as stunning as I thought that was. Here they come in with all the spreadsheets. And they are there to prove to me that they are actually saving the taxpayers of the state of Washington money because if these people lived longer lives, they would be in nursing homes and we would be paying extraordinary costs for the nursing home care of these individuals. That was cut short, obviously, because they died of a smoking-related illness, and therefore we, so remember that, we yeah. saved money. Yeah. So this is up in your office in the highways licenses bill? Yeah, it's in the conference room. Conference room, yeah. And I will tell you, I just looked at them like, oh my God, you didn't just say what you just said, did you? And then I thought, I, you know, I had to misunderstand. I j there's no way they said that. So I said, can I repeat what I thought you said? Then in essence, at the end of litigation, I will owe you money. <laughs> Because you killed off my people in my state that otherwise I would have had to house in a nursing home and pay for it. Do I get that right? Well, we wouldn't say it quite like that, but you're getting the essence of it. To which I got up and said, gentlemen, because it was all gentlemen, the meeting is over. Goodbye. And left and we filed. And filed with me. With much trepidation. Yes. Oh, I remember. Oh, I, you I know, remember. it's the most nervous I have ever been as Attorney General because I wasn't going to go to the legislature and ask for money because I wouldn't let them run the case, right? I didn't want it to be political and run by the legislature. So we'd have to go out to the private sector on a contingency, and that there that's fraught with peril. And we'd have to have our own staff involved, and I'd have to use the antitrust fund. And... Would I win in the end? Would we replenish the money in the antitrust account? Would we, what would happen? Uh, and I tell you, it was a nerve wracking period. So you had multiple claims. Among them was an antitrust claim yes. that allowed you to tap the antitrust fund. Yes. 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 And was that sort of a unique theory or? Uh... It was unique to the industry uh, in that no one else had, had made the claim. Right. But frankly, I don't think anyone else really could have made the claim. Okay. Okay. So it was unique to AG's offices. Uh, ours was a more aggressive one because we have a, a more healthy, in my opinion, and I trust law. Uh, so Mike Moore's wasn't quite as aggressive as ours was. But so our cases were all unique, and I think we were the what fourth or fifth to file. I would say would be my guess. Uh, and then these negotiations started. Can I ask a question on the interference? So, so what was the, um, this was all states doing this. Mm -hmm. Was this one of those situations where the federal government wasn't moving and so state leaders like yourself just got together and said, it's up to us? I can't tell you, Jeff, how much time we spent, those of us who were leading it, 
in trying to get the federal government to bring the suit. And we kept being adamant that, you know, we shouldn't have to bring 50 suits, okay? In large part, it's unfair deceptive advertising. Well, if you stop it countrywide, I'm good. It's antitrust claims having to do with Medicaid. If you stop it, I'm good. Mm -hmm. So you guys should be bringing this action. And we could not get them to go. And this was the Clinton administration. Correct. We could not get them to go. So we were on our own. <laughs> so you, you made reference to this, but you hired specials. Mm -hmm to help with the case. And so what sort of considerations went into to that? So we really needed uh, someone who had the coffins, frankly, to be able to make this happen because we knew that the industry was going to try and destroy us financially. Forget the merits of the case by asking for every conceivable record from the Department of Social and Health Services that would require us to hire people there you know, digitize everything, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to have uh, those in the private sector who would go, if we lost, they get nothing. I mean, we didn't have a dime to spend on them, but they had to have the money to put up front for what would be a very rigorous discovery process. And in the end, we were one of probably two states that did as much discovery. Minnesota is the other one. Florida never did, and uh, Mississippi never did, and no one else ever got to trial like we did. Um, and we had to have people who really were good at trial work, that really could take the jury, get them to understand. It was, it was gonna, there was no question it was going to be complex, because you had to get through all this evidence um, of all the activities that they had hidden, and, and it, so on and so forth. So we had to have some really sophisticated trial work. And uh, so, do you want to talk about the ultimate outcome in the case? <laughs> 98, I think. Well, we had one settlement along the way that everybody has forgotten. It required uh, federal law change. Um, and as hard as we worked, we couldn't get that done. Uh, and that really would have meant that no one could bring an individual action against them again, um, or class action, actually class action against them again. And uh, Senator John McCain became my best friend working on this, and he couldn't get it through. Slate was on the panel at the time, that committee, um, and we just we couldn't make it happen. So went back. At, at this point, Minnesota, Florida, Mississippi have all um, settled. So I'm kind of the remaining person from the previous uh, set of negotiations. So I ended up in a leadership role. The industry had made it clear they wanted the negotiations strictly confidential, so I couldn't even tell my colleagues, uh, which when it, the news broke, got me in a lot of hot water with my colleagues. So be it. Um, anyway, ultimately settled. Um, largest settlement uh, then and still now in the history of the world. Um, it, so, you know, um, a sizable amount of money over 25 years, but it goes forever. Um, so you could ask, is that what I'm most proud of? No. What I'm most proud of today is if you go down and you walk the streets of New York, you don't look at building after building with Joe Camel or the Marlboro Man. You don't see on top of every taxi cab an ad for one of those products. Which you used to. Absolutely. Yeah, every I week I, I would come home on a Friday night, red eye back on a Sunday night, as I'd arrive at O Dark Hundred in the morning, that would, it would motivate me with no sleep to get in there and fight because I couldn't stand. And all these kids walking around with their backpacks and the trinkets and trash. That, I mean, that's all changed. The advertising practices and so on. So if you ask me what I'm most proud of, it isn't the money, uh, because in the end the states didn't do a good job of using the money. Um, Could have, but didn't. Um, but what I'm most proud of uh, is, frankly, the the stopping of the preying on uh, those for whom the product is illegal. So, can you talk a little bit about who Jeffrey Wigand was, mm. and what role, if any, he played in all of this? And, uh... So, a movie was made about this uh, man. He was uh, an employee, research, in research employee, uh, with one of the companies. Um, and he began to see 
uh, things that were um, disconcerting to him. So he began taking documents uh, under his coat as he would depart at night, Xeroxing them and returning them the next day. Things like um, one study that they ultimately stopped the study uh, and sent all the documents to England, except we had gotten them from Wigand, okay, in which they had found what they set out to find, which is that the addictiveness of the product is highly related to the age at which the onset of smoking takes place. So the younger you can get a person to smoke, the more addictive it is to them. So if I start smoking at 25, it's much less addictive to me than if I started at 15. When they saw enough evidence that that was what their research had found, and they, hence the direct relationship to those ads. Correct. They shut down, we, that's what we were trying to show at trial, right. They shut down that research project, sent all the documents to England. Well, Wigan was bringing those documents out, okay? Uh, and they found out about it. Uh, they fired the man. Um, he lost his job. He lost his marriage. He was a subject of death threats. He went into bankruptcy. I mean, this man went through it all. Classic whistleblower. Yes. Yes. And I remember in the first settlement, we were all but done, and we were about to go across the street from the hotel we were at to a hotel on the other side where we would hold the press conference. And we said, well, we need the documents dismissing all your lawsuits against Jeffrey Wigand. And, quote, the Brown and Williamson CEO was in England on a train with no access to a phone, so they couldn't do it, but they would continue to try and get him in the days that followed. And we said, well, no, that isn't going to work. The, the whole premise of our being here, and again, this is where they didn't understand AGs, is that, you know, you would do this. Um, and one of us overheard one of the other ones saying they don't have the guts to walk away from billions of dollars. They will all walk home and lose their next election if this is what they're going to do. There were, I think, seven AGs in the meeting at the time. Uh, we took a vote. It was seven to zero. A lot of tears. Um, and walked out and said, we're done. We're walking. We're going home. There is no settlement. And we were told to wait a couple minutes and so on. Within the hour, we had the signed documents. And it was all a bluff. And it wasn't true. And they still were so angry with this man. They wanted to destroy him. Well, he has since dedicated his life to the cause and leads a foundation where he goes to schools all around the country to talk about, you know, what it what the product does and how they how they got to it and so on and so forth. So he's a hero in, you know, one line not mine that was, was stated in the final hours there was we said no man would be left behind or woman and we're not gonna leave Wigan behind. And so we didn't. So one of my proudest moments as Attorney General, by the way. Get it on the yeah. uh, So this went on for a few years. How was the office functioning while you were? Kathy, in good hands of <laughs> Kathy and the team. Um, I was gone, literally gone. I mean, I would come home on a Friday night, and I would leave uh, and red eye back on Sunday. And it did go for years. Um, so the office... You know, I don't know if the office, you guys have to tell me, I don't know if they missed a beat um, or that they missed me. Um, but, you know, the other thing is, and, you know, correct me, y'all, but my sense of it was everybody knew in the office how hard I was working. But I had literally no life, and I was giving it a thousand percent. And everybody stepped up an inch taller yeah. uh, to make sure that nothing went wrong while I was off doing that. It's kind of my sense of things. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah, I, I actually think that people had a good sense even how their role supported that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. We were at a, a division meeting one time. I'm not sure you were there, but a fellow in the print shop. Jeff, do you remember Jeff? Mm -hmm. from yeah. Aguilar. Yeah, yeah. Aguilar from yeah. the print shop. So eloquently described his role in supporting the tobacco See, litigation. I love it. And I just was blown away by yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think everybody, and it's true, everybody in the office felt that they were a part of it. 
and that they had to step it up a, a bit to make sure that nothing went wrong so that my attention was completely in a work. Thanks for listening to this AGO Moment in History. Be sure to like and subscribe to receive updates when we upload a new episode. On our next episode, Governor Gregoire talks about her experiences arguing at the U.S. Supreme Court. Thanks, and talk to you again soon.